Bowie. I just received an email from Dr. Tanarat. should I do? He's an excellent student. <laughs> what should I do? Huh? Dr. Tanarak, tell me. Excellent student. He's already done security. He should get an A. What should I do? From Dr. Tanarak? From address Tanarak at S-I-T-T-U-A-C-T-H. Which is correct. That's his email address. But in fact, it's a fake message. It's sent by someone maliciously and pretending. I, I received it. I didn't send it. I received it. And simply change the from address in the email address. So in email especially, it's very easy. You can control the actual from address in an email. So there are certain fields in an email, from, to, and so on, subject. In this case, uh, I, cha I created an email and changed the from address to be Tanarak's email address. So when, in a different account, I sent it, when I receive it here, it says it's from Dr. Tanarak. So that's, an, that's a simple demonstration of a masquerade attack, someone pretending to be someone else in this case. And without, all right, maybe this one I would not believe if I saw it, but in other cases, you may believe that message and believe uh, who the source was. But for security, we need something better than just using the from address to identify someone. We need cryptographic techniques to provide authentication. Uh, some of you may have seen with email, you can provide uh, signatures, digital signatures at the end of the email. And we'll see as we go through the course that you can attach information to the email that gives the receiver much more confidence that it came from the right person using public and private keys. We'll come to that after the midterm. Uh, another example. So that's an example of a masquerade attack. The other example is I want to show is me accessing the wireless network. And it will take a little bit to set up, but uh, let me. Here's my high-tech picture of what we want to do uh, while I set this up. I've got my two laptops here, okay? The, the blue one and the, the one on the screen is the, the, the black one, the gray one. Uh, what I'm going to do is use this to access a, a website. And of course, since I'm using wireless LAN, I'm connecting to some access point, which is where? Outside in the corridor in this case. So I'm going to connect to an access point outside. And this other laptop, which you see the screen, is going to hopefully, if it works, intercept the message and see the message contents. Um, just to illustrate how easy it is. Now, let's, only if it works. Let's try. What I'm, first just make sure that this laptop no, with this malicious user, the laptop um, you see up here, I need to configure it to intercept messages. Normally with wireless LAN, with Wi-Fi, you uh, transmit to an access point and receive from access point. So you associate with an access point and you only communicate with that access point. And then that access point sends it across the rest of the network. So when you turn on your laptop, 
what it does is your laptop finds or discovers some nearby access points and then associates with one of them. Another feature of wireless LAN and, and many wireless technologies is that the transmission is, a, is broadcast. That is, when I transmit a signal to the access point out in the corridor, it goes, of course, to the access point, but from the antenna in my laptop, it spreads all around, in fact. The signal goes in that direction, in that direction, up and down, all around. So anyone within range of that signal, so within 5, 10 metres, should be able to receive the signal. So in fact, what I'm going to do is, with the blue laptop, send to the access point, and because my other laptop is within range, I'm going to configure it such that it will receive that signal. Normally, your laptop will not receive other people's signals. Actually, it will receive other people's signals, but it will not, uh, it will discard their signals, because you normally, you only receive and process data that is sent to you, or data that you send. Okay? But you can configure some operating systems such that if someone else sends to the access point, if I receive the signal, I can receive and process their data. I'll set that up and then we'll show what, what we can achieve by doing that. Uh, I need to remember the instructions. I need to turn my wireless LAN interface into a mode such that it can receive other people's signals. And I'll do it quickly here uh, using ifconfig. You're going to learn some of these commands in the lab uh, next week. Right. I'm just going to, for the start, turn off my wireless LAN interface and then set it up and then turn it back on. And now I'm going to set it up using another command called iwconfig to configure my wireless interface. The name of my wireless interface is WLAN0. And there's a special mode. And it's called monitor mode, which means when the wireless LAN on my laptop is on, it's going to monitor whatever anyone else within range sends. Monitor in intercept, in fact, and record everything that other people send. Normally your laptop does not use monitor mode. It's a special case. And just to confirm, so my wireless LAN interface is in the monitor mode at the moment. It's not doing anything. It will not send data. It will just receive other people's data. And Turn it on. And the last thing, I'm going to monitor a specific channel. You don't have to remember this, it's just one demonstration. Not for the wireless, but for the, the next step. Channel. Monitor channel 13. Because hopefully this laptop's going to use channel 13 to communicate with the access point outside. That's the uncertainty in this demo. And then so now my laptop should be receiving all the packets sent by other people, via other people's tablets, phones, laptops in the, in the vicinity. My laptop can receive anything that they send. And I'm going to record everything that I receive using a program called TCP Dump, which just records all the packets other people are sending on my wireless LAN interface some options which are not so important and write to a file. That Now my laptop is recording to a file all the packets other people send. So don't do anything on your phone or on your tablet because I will record it. But I will do something on this, this laptop. And you cannot see it. I'm just setting up to turn on the wireless. I need to do it correctly. Um, I'm just trying to connect to the SIT wireless LAN.
slowly. I've connected to the SIT wireless LAN. I have an IP address. And you cannot see, but uh, okay, I just open my web browser and I've got the SIT login, so now I need to enter my login and I'll access the website. And I accessed my favorite website, the, the, the course website web page. And I'll just follow a link. And now let's look what data my laptop sent to the access point by looking at what my other laptop captured. So we'll close that. So this software, TCP dump, records all the packets that my wireless LAN interface receives. And because this blue laptop was sending some data, as were other people probably, but they were sending data within vicinity of this capturing laptop, it received a signal, TCP dump recorded the packets and recorded them into a file, example.cap. In fact, it received 62,184 packets. Let's look at those packets. And Wireshark is a program that will look at, display them in a nicer format. And it displays many of them. I logged into the SIT website, into the SIT internet access system. When you access the, the network here, you need to provide your username and password. Okay. In fact, that server that provides that service, I remember its IP address. It's, I think, 192.168.20.109. That is, I'm filtering out the packets. And let's zoom in so it's a bit clearer. I'm filtering out the packets which were between my blue laptop, hopefully, and the SIT login server. You know that page that asks you for your username and password. And these are some of the packets. We see there's a TCP connection set up. There's a request from my computer, 10.10.97.210, to the 192.168.20 computer. It was a request for the web page. And the SIT login server sends back a response, which is that actual web page, asking me for my username, password, and showing that long warning message. Then I typed in my username and password. Let's go down and see if we find it. whether this is the correct one. Let's zoom in. So here, the orange one is from my computer. Actually, what's wrong? Any, anyone recognize anything wrong? Two different computers logged in. Here's I'm, my computer. My blue one is 10.10.99.251. The previous packets were a different computer. Someone else logged in. I will not look at their password. I'll just look at my own. Okay. <laughs> so, so mine is in fact, starts here. This is when I uh, log in. If we zoom in on that particular packet, we can see some of the details. It's a HTTP packet. And it's a request. A request for access to the internet. And then, now let's try and find the then there's the response, and somewhere down below, it's just some data and some acts there. More acts. Well, 
one of these should contain, uh, I don't think it's that one. Let's filter again. This is like doing a, any demo, nothing works 100%. Let's show just the HTTP packets. I need to look for my IP address, which is the 251. Getting closer here. So this is from my computer, 10199251, going to the SIT login server. It's a post. What happens with the web login is that you try and access the internet, SIT login server sends you this login page. You type in your username and password, click OK, and that sends data back to the server and checks your username and password. Let's zoom in. looking at the details of that packet. What do you see? Because I typed in my username and password and that was sent of course to the server because the server needs to authenticate me. So that's sent to the server and from a blue laptop, my other laptop captured that data. And this is showing the packets which were captured and I found one of those packets and somewhere inside that packet we see, we see, my, we see the data that was sent from laptop to server, including username and password. Okay, and the rest of the message. So that's sent to the server and the server then checks, is it my correct password? If so, it logs me in. Okay, and then we continue. Don't log into my account now. <laughs> I, I will, will change it. That will be changed soon. So that's an example of simply releasing the message contents by someone intercepting they have captured the data that was sent from Bob to Alice and Darth has captured that and they see the contents. In this case they can use that in the future. So in this case there's no, and in SIT's login, there's no encryption for the, the internet access. So you need to be careful with your passwords uh, because especially don't use your password don't use a password here that you use in other systems. So I do not use this password for my bank account, for example. <laughs> okay? So because if someone finds it, then they also have access to your other systems. So in this case, there's no encryption. You can set up encryption, but it involves more steps with, with the setting up the network. Okay, that's two examples of the types of attacks which are possible and quite easy. <coughs> what we want to go through then is, well, how do we stop those attacks? How, what techniques can we use such that someone cannot see the password? So that someone cannot pretend to be someone else with an email? Well, those techniques mainly require or rely upon encryption transforming some data into some 
other form and sending that transformed data, that encrypted data. So what we're going to do to demonstrate the concepts of encryption is to look at some old classical encryption ciphers, algorithms. So by old, thousands of years old in some cases. So that is the, the first things that, that come up. Um, no longer used, of course, but they demonstrate the principles and are easy to give some examples on the board or, or on a piece of paper. Classical encryption techniques. We'll see some more terminology come up. I don't need this. We're going to talk about and all these old techniques and up until the last, say, 30 or 50 years, the techniques have used what's called symmetric encryption, symmetric ciphers. It's only in the last, uh, maybe since the 1970s, since alternative an alternative has come up called asymmetric or public key cryptography. So at least up until the midterm, we're focusing what is symmetric key encryption. We'll explain what that what is what it is. First, some terminology. What we're going to do to encrypt something, we take some message, apply some algorithm on that message, and we get some output. The original message we refer to as the plain text. It doesn't have to be text, but the, the, what the message we refer to as plain text. Okay? Plain meaning it, is, uh, it can be read. We take the plain text, we apply some transformation, some encryption algorithm, and as the output, we get ciphertext. Okay? So we encrypt plain text and get ciphertext. Encryption is this process of converting from plain text to ciphertext, sometimes called enciphering. So we have some function that takes plain text, returns ciphertext. That's an encryption function. And we normally need to go back in the other direction as well. Given the ciphertext, we decrypt that and get the original plain text back. And encryption usually depends upon the fact that if you take some plain text and encrypt to get the ciphertext, then you should be able to take that ciphertext and decrypt and get the same original plain text. Okay? You don't want to get different plain text as the output. With symmetric key encryption, we use a key at both the sender and receiver. When I say the sender and receiver, I will talk about that model that we finished on uh, before the break, where we have the source, the sender, has some message to send to the receiver. The source has a plain text message. They encrypt it. They get some ciphertext. They send the ciphertext to the receiver. The receiver takes the ciphertext, decrypts, and gets the plain text. To perform the encryption and decryption, you don't just have the plain text and ciphertext. There's another piece of information, the key. And that key is normally secret. That is known just to the sender and receiver. If someone else knows it, it's not a secret. And it, our system will not work. Cryptography is the study of the algorithms used for encryption. So all we've said here is we convert plain text to ciphertext. How do we do that? Well, there's different ways that we can perform that conversion. They are encryption algorithms. Those algorithms, or the study of those algorithms, is cryptography. A cipher or a cryptographic system is a particular algorithm. So we'll talk about shortly the Caesar cipher, the Playfair cipher, two different algorithms. Cryptanalysis is the study of the techniques for decryption without knowledge of the plain text. That is like breaking the, the cipher. If you've got the cipher text, you want to get back the plain text, then what techniques can we do to obtain that plain text? Cryptology is just the areas of cryptanalysis and cryptography. Just some terminology. This is similar to that diagram we finished on. And maybe this is a, uh, well, 
it uses the terminology we've just introduced and maybe a bit easier when we go through it as an example. Again, we have a source on this side and wants to send some data to the receiver on the other side. So we start with our original message, the plain text input. We have some plain text, x, if we want to use some mathematical notation. We have an encryption algorithm, some algorithm, that transforms plain text into ciphertext. That algorithm takes two inputs. It takes the plain text as input, x, and a key, k, some secret information. So what we get is that we take the plain text, the key, apply our encryption algorithm, and we get some output. The ciphertext is the output, denoted here as y. Uh, in this case, x is the plain text. k is the key. and y is the ciphertext in this slide. In other cases, we'll use different notation like p, k, and c. And the encryption algorithm is expressed as a function here. It's a function that takes two inputs, the plain text and the key, and returns one output, y, the ciphertext. So we see in the middle here y, the ciphertext, equals e, e is a function, the encryption function, e of k and x. So e, this function e, is our encryption algorithm. Just the notation used on this slide. And we see two inputs, and the output is the ciphertext. We send the ciphertext across the network to the destination. The destination has a decryption algorithm. So a decryption algorithm takes the ciphertext as input. So the ciphertext is received. That's one input. Takes the key as input, the same key as used on the other side, and decrypts, and if everything works correctly, they'll get the original plain text as output. So we also have D, the decryption algorithm. And if, if the algorithms are correct, then using the same key k and the ciphertext, we'll get x, which is the plain text, as an output. So plain text message at the start, and the same plain text message is received at the receiver. What is sent across the network is the ciphertext. What the attacker can see here, this is our network or our communication channel, the attacker, the opponent, sees the ciphertext. If the attacker can intercept the message, then they find out why the ciphertext. The key, k, should be secret. Only the source and the destination need to, should know k. If the attacker knows k, what do they do? What can the attacker do if they know k? they should be able to decrypt under one assumption that the algorithm is known. Okay? So we have different pieces of information here. The plain text, the key, the ciphertext, an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm. From the attacker's perspective, they can intercept and find the ciphertext. In most practical cases, we assume that the algorithm is known. Everyone knows the algorithm, including the attacker. 
They know the function for encrypting and decrypting. Only in very special cases where that's not true. For example, uh, in, in maybe in the military or in some government organisations where they keep the algorithm secret. But it's very hard to do so. Because in practice, someone needs to implement software or hardware to do this encryption. And that takes many people. And to keep that secret requires a lot of physical resources. In most practical cases and encryption that we use today, the algorithms for encrypting and decrypting are not secret. They are known by everyone. That is, you and I know them, the attacker knows what they are. The ciphertext can be known by the attacker. We assume that the attacker or the opponent can receive anything sent across the channel, which is the ciphertext. So this is known by the attacker. The goal of the attacker is to find k and or, what have we got, x, the plain text. If the attacker can find the key, then they know the decryption algorithm. They know why. If they also know the key k, then they can find x, because the decrypting using key k of y gives us x, the plain text. So if the attacker knows the key, they can easily find the, or calculate the plain text. And if they know the plain text, then we haven't kept our message secret or confidential. Our system is not secure. That's the basic model for encryption. And it's similar to the last slide that we finished with on uh, just before the break. Just a different perspective. What do we need for this to work? To provide some security, let's, we'll describe on that slide, but let's, from the attacker's perspective, they can find the ciphertext, they know the encryption and decryption algorithm. They, let's say they want to find the plain text. If they find the plain text, our system is not secure. How do they find the plain text? We know the plain text can be found by decrypting with the key, the ciphertext. We know the function. The attacker knows the function. They know y, the plain text. If they know k, they can find x. So one objective, find the key k. Okay. Well, we assume that the key is secret. If it becomes publicly known, then the security of this, of this system fails. It falls down. So the assumption is that the source and receiver keep the key K secret. If I'm communicating with someone and we decide upon a secret key, if for some reason someone else discovers that secret key, we cannot trust it and we can no longer securely communicate. The key must be secret. What else could they do? So if they find the key, the system falls down. But look what we have here. Uh, what's our other function? Y equals encrypt key with key K X, we get Y. Sometimes, well, we'd like to make the algorithm such that it's hard to find the key. Even if you know some pairs of plaintext and ciphertext. So we'll see there are different classifications of the security of the system and the types of attacks. But first thing, keep this key secret. And the second, have an algorithm which is considered strong. We need to define what we mean by strong or secure, a strong in terms of security an algorithm such that it's hard to find what the key is. So we need a strong encryption algorithm. What is this function E and, and the corresponding D? Given if the attacker knows the algorithm and the ciphertext, 
should be impossible or practically impossible to find the key or the plain text from that algorithm. If, if the algorithm has that property, then we consider it strong. And the other assumption or requirement we have is that both the sender and receiver know the secret key and keep it secret. If, if they tell someone else, it's no longer considered secret. In practice, we will assume that the cipher, that is the encryption and decryption algorithm, are known, are public. Everyone knows the details of these algorithms, including the attacker. And we assume that the key to get from the sender receiver is somehow securely distributed. For example, I want to encrypt and send a secure message to one person. So what I do is I choose a key, some random key. I write it down on a piece of paper, give it to the other person, and then we do our encryption. As long as that piece of paper stays secure, we're OK. But it's not so easy in practice. I want to communicate with someone on the other side of the world via the internet. I cannot write down the key on a piece of paper and send it via post. It's going to take a few days to get there. Not very convenient. So in network systems, we need some automatic ways to distribute keys. And we assume, so far, we assume that we've got some magic way to distribute keys from sender to receiver so that no one else knows the key. One of the topics is key management, where we look at how to distribute keys. But for now, we assume we can. This is uh, almost the same system, but also shows the attacker, uh, formerly the crypt, an crypt analyst here. Using the same mathematical notation, some slight variations. We have a message, or the, the thing that generates the message, some message source. X, the plain text, an encryption algorithm. We have a key source, something that generates or calculates keys. And somehow the key is distributed to both the source and the receiver securely. No one else knows the key except the source and, and destination. We encrypt, get the ciphertext, send the ciphertext, and decrypt and get the plain text. The attacker, crypt analyst here, can intercept the ciphertext. Their goal is to find the plain text and or the key. Usually if you find the plain text, you've, you've defeated the security of the system. If you find the key, you can easily find the plain text. So the goal of the attacker is to find the key or the plain text. That's here. It's denoted as x hat, k hat, because they try and calculate what the key in the plain text is. And of course, it should be the same as the real values. If they can find them, we wouldn't consider this secure. We need algorithms such that they cannot find these. So that's some of the notation and general terms for uh, encryption. Before we give some specific examples, a little bit more notation. What are these algorithms for encryption? How do we encrypt? Well, there are two, two main operations used to transform the plain text to ciphertext. And they're very simple operations. Substitution and transposition. Quite simply, substitution is you take one element of the plain text and replace it with another. Let's say the plain text is made up of English characters. Hello, H-E-L-L-O. Then there are five elements in this plain text, the five letters. Substitution is taking one of the elements, the letter H, and replacing it with another letter in the alphabet. Let's say replace H with X. That's substituting one element with another. Transposition is rearranging those elements. If we have H-E-L-L-O, we may rearrange those five characters to be L-E-H-O-L. -L. That's transposition. Using these two simple operations, 
we'll see most, or most ciphers that we'll see, the symmetric ciphers we'll go through, use these simple operations. But to provide more security, they combine them. They don't just do a substitution or just a transposition. They use both of them and they repeat them. So we get what's called product systems, which are multiple stages of substituting and transpositions. So replace one letter with another letter, do that for all the letters, then rearrange according to some algorithm, then do it again in another stage and again and again. We'll see that pattern comes out in the ciphers we go through. In general in encryption, there are two different types, symmetric key encryption, symmetric key cryptography, and public key encryption, also called asymmetric. So symmetric, sometimes called single key encryption, secret key encryption, shared key encryption, conventional. It's the original approach used. And it's been used up and it's still used today. It's quite significant. In the last 40 or so years, this new approach called public key or asymmetric encryption was developed. What's the difference at this point in time? Symmetric uses one key known by both the source and destination, the sender and receiver. Symmetric, that is it's the same key. Asymmetric or public key encryption, there are two different keys. The sender uses one key, the receiver uses a different key, a different, not asymmetric. But usually, or well, there must be some relationship between the two different keys. We're going to focus on symmetric key encryption. After the midterm, we'll come back to public key encryption and how that works. Another way to classify ciphers is on how much plain text do they operate at any time. A block cipher encrypts a block of plain text. Usually the block in practice is say 64 bits or 128 bits. A stream cipher encrypts the elements continuously, say one bit at a time. We're going to focus on block ciphers. We'll see one example later of uh, stream ciphers. Let's go to an example cipher and then come back to the types of attacks. So we'll jump forward. And what we're going to do is go through some classical techniques for using first substitution. That is, replacing one element with another. And then a few with transposition rearranging. And use them to demonstrate the concepts that are used in most sites. I think with all of the examples that we'll use, we'll use the English alphabet, okay, from A to Z. But it doesn't have to be, it can be any alphabet, any set of characters. It can be binary, it can be Thai, it can be uh, numbers, uh, whatever we choose, as long as it's defined. But for simple examples, the English alphabet. With substitution ciphers, the letters of the plain text, the plain text message we want to send, are replaced with other letters or by other numbers or symbols, or by numbers or symbols, not of symbols. Uh, no, replaced by other letters or by numbers, yeah, or symbols. Okay. We would use again English, but in if we're using a computer, we usually represent that plain text as binary, as bits. So we usually we replace a sequence of bits, let's say four bits with a different sequence of bits, or eight bits with a different sequence of bits. Let's go through the first example, the Caesar cipher. Supposedly used by Caesar, a Roman general, a long time ago, to send secret messages to his, his army so that the others would not be able to intercept and find out the instructions. We have an alphabet with the 20, 26 English characters. And the original Caesar cipher is that we take the input plain text letter and the cipher text is 
that plain text left letter shifted to the right by three positions. So if the input plain text letter is A, the output cipher text is D, because D is one, two, three positions along in the alphabet. If the input letter is Y, then the output is B, because B is one, two, three positions along. We wrap around at the end, so we, have we can use all the letters. So that's the, the simplest cipher that we can, uh, that we'll go through. We can generalize that. So this shifts by three positions, the original Caesar cipher. We can generalize it to shift by any number of positions, k positions. So we define the cipher by how many positions we shift the, the letters. So allow a shift of k positions. And we can express that mathematically by mapping the letters to numbers. And a common mapping is that the letter A maps to number 0. The letter Z maps to number what? 25. Okay, So we just map each letter to the numbers. And the shift by positions is that we add the number of positions. A is 0. If we shift by 3 positions, the cipher text should be D, which is 3. 0 plus 3. If we shift by 4 positions, it's 0 plus 4. And we get E as the output. So we can express the encryption algorithm mathematically here. The ciphertext C is obtained by encrypting the plain text P using key K. Key, the key K is the number of positions we shift, which is calculated as taking the value of the plain text element P plus K. So we just add. And because we wrap around, we need to mod by 26. 26 because we have 26 characters. To deal with this case where we take Y, we shift by three positions and we get B. That's why we have this mod 26 at the end. And to decrypt, we go backwards. That is in the opposite direction. To decrypt the cipher text G is the letter three positions beforehand, which is D. And mathematically, it's the ciphertext minus the number of positions we shift, mod 26. Just a quick, simple task to get your brain working. Here's your plain text. Encrypted. Calculate the ciphertext. Hello, everyone, with a key of four. Simple. And In this case, you can simply use the information on the, on, well, no, you cannot use that exact shift, but you can look from the alphabet here and shift four positions along. First letter? L. Okay, I think you don't have to go all the way. Not always, but sometimes we'll, to distinguish between plain text and ciphertext, I'll write plain text as lowercase and ciphertext as uppercase, just to distinguish.
Okay? L. Next. Z for Z. Okay, so you can encrypt anything with a Caesar cipher, and you should be able to decrypt. Okay, the decryption uh, conceptually is just shifting backwards, but note the. Uh, Mathematically, when we're using the, the numbers, the ciphertext value minus the key value, mod 26. With our key is 4. Uh, the letter, what do we have here? Uh, do we have one interesting? If we have the letter B, integer 1, what's the value of the plaintext? Using the mathematical approach. Well, quite simply, P equals the ciphertext value 1 minus the key for mod 26. Three minus three mod twenty six is what? Minus three mod twenty six. Twenty three. Okay. We don't have in modular arithmetic we don't have our negative values here. We just have from zero up to twenty five with mod twenty six. And this is this implements that wrap around feature. which is the letter X, is that right? So be careful with the, the mathematical form. Okay? I just made that up. The C is the ciphertext. If the ciphertext letter was B, that is value 1, then this is what we'd calculate. Okay. But that's not related to the holo of everyone. We'll see with our ciphers, even the simple ones, we can express that as an algorithm or as an equation here. And we can implement that, of course, quite easily in software. What's wrong with the Caesar cipher? Brute force, and we'll explain brute force uh, a little bit more, but with the Caesar cipher, how many keys are there? 26 keys, really. How many possible keys, sorry? How many possible keys? In, in one instance, the, we have one key, but remember what we do is the source chooses a secret key. That is, I choose k equal to 4. I tell the other person, we're going to use k equal to 4. Then I take my plain text, hello everyone. I encrypt it using k equal to 4. I get my cipher text, send the cipher text, and the receiver decrypts using k equal to 4. k is a secret own, known only to the source and destination. If someone else knows the key, they can easily decrypt. If you have this, the ciphertext, and you know the key, you'll just do the calculation here and you'll get the plaintext. Okay? So if you don't know the key, if you know this, 
you don't know k equal to 4, what do you do? Guess? Uh, guess. How many guesses will you take? Twenty-five guesses. Why? Okay, it, you guess that the maximum number, or the most guesses you need to make, is the number of keys available. Okay, because what can the key be? It could be zero. But if the key was zero. It's not a very smart key to choose. Why? A key of zero gives us the same plain text and cipher text. We don't shift by any positions. It's possible in theory. Okay? A key of one is possible. Two, three, four, five. A key of 25 is possible. What about a key of 26? A key of 26, because we have this mod 26, we're going to have some number plus 26 mod 26, which will always be the same as plus 0, okay? That number plus 0, because it's a mod 26. 26 mod 26 is the same as 0 20 mod 26. A key of 27 is the same as a key of 1, okay? So in effect, we only have 26 possible combinations, and one of them is not so good because it gives us the same plain text and cipher text. So, if you don't know the key, try them all. That is, take the ciphertext, decrypt with all possible keys, and see what you get. I'll show you an example. You cannot see all of it. This is just in a spreadsheet. Uh, it may not be all clear. This is some ciphertext, OK? There's, it goes longer than this but there's no need to see the rest. So I, I've created this cipher text. What's the key? What's the plain text? Well, you cannot see the plain text from there. It, it's, nothing's obvious. So what we do is you try to decrypt this cipher text using all possible keys. You don't know the key. So let's do what's called a brute force attack and try to decrypt the ciphertext with every possible key, all 26 keys in our case. And I've done that. And here I've got the original ciphertext at the top. And then I decrypted this using a key of A, where A maps to the letter 0. And that's our not very smart key because we get the same if we decrypt this ciphertext with a key of zero the plain text is the same do you think key of the key of zero was what was used in this case no. why not it doesn't make sense you would expect that the plain text message would make sense okay so I try a key equal to 1 and I get this. And I try them all. And we scroll down. You watch and see, tell me what the key is. All right, it's not e easy, but uh, I think you quickly see that this one, L or 11, the only true, truly secure computer is one buried in concrete with the power with the power turned off and then something else at the end and then the network cable cut okay that's a secure computer that's our plain text well we we guess that's the plain text look at all the other keys any message you understand there all 26 keys in this case all the rest look like random letters or a, a random combination of letters. There's just one of those plain texts which makes sense. Therefore, it's safe to assume that that is the correct plain text, and it's safe to assume the key is 11 in this case. So that's a brute force attack. Take the cipher text, decrypt it with every possible key. One of the answers 
will be a message that you understand and therefore you've discovered the plain text and the key. That works assuming you can understand or you can recognize the message. Okay? In this case we can. We guessed that the message was in English. What if it was in a different language, Portuguese? You may not be able to recognize it, but the same concept applies. Assuming you know or you, the language, you will be able to recognize the message. And if you don't know the language, then try to translate it to a different language. That is, use different languages. There are not so many languages in the, in the world to try uh, all of them. Okay. So assuming you can recognize the plain text, brute force attack will always work. Because one of the messages will be a message you recognize. All the rest would look like uh, random letters, random characters. And the Caesar cipher is subject to a brute force attack because there are just 26 keys. Easy to try them all. You could have done this on a piece of paper, take some time. I did it with a computer, okay? It takes you know, less than a second. So one type of attack against all ciphers is a brute force attack. Let's go back a few slides. Where? Yeah, brute force attacks. A brute force attack, try all possible keys. The time it takes to perform a brute force attack depends upon the number of keys that you need to try. With Caesar cipher, 26 keys. This table gives us some different examples. What it shows us is if we have a cipher with a particular key size, and here we measure the key size in bits. In Caesar cipher it's not measured in bits, it's, it's uh, uh, decimal numbers. But assuming we have, say, a 32-bit key, with 32 bits, how many possible values are there? If you, 2 to the power of 32. If you've got 32-bit number, then there are 2 to the power of 32 possible numbers. So if I have a cipher with a 32-bit key, there are 2 to the power of 32 possible keys. It's listed here, which is about 4 billion. Okay? 4.3 4 by, 4 by 10 to the 9. That's the number of possible keys. So if I do a brute force attack, I need to try 4 billion possible keys. On average though, assuming the, the person who chose the key randomly chose a key, on average when I try my keys as a brute force attack, I will only have to try half of them before I get the correct answer. Let's demonstrate that. Uh, Let's say a 3-bit key. Three bit key, the possible values. There are eight. So I'm using a three bit key. Uh, choose a key, don't tell anyone. Write it down. Choose one. Don't tell me, especially. Okay, chosen one. Okay. I try this one. And so what I'll do is I'll take the cipher text, I'll decrypt using this key. And if it was the correct key, I would be able to recognize the plain text. If it was an incorrect key, the plain text from decrypting would be, like we saw on the, the Caesar cipher, would be random characters. So the idea is that if I decrypt with the correct key, I will recognize the plain text and I'm finished. If I decrypt with the wrong key, I will get random characters, I know it's not correct, and I'll move on to the next key and try that. 
So I would try this one. Would I get the correct plain text? No. I try this one. Would I get the correct plain text? No. If I try this one, this one, this one, this one. Okay. That's the key he chose. So all I did is try them all. I would decrypt my ciphertext and I get 101 because when I decrypt my ciphertext with 101, since it was encrypted using key 101, I will get the correct plain text now. How many attempts? Six. Maximum number of attempts I'd take is eight if he chose this one. Minimum is one. On average, it would be half the key space, four in this case. Okay? Because on average, if, if you choose a random key, sometimes it will be quickly I'll find it, sometimes it will take me a long time. On average, it will be half the number of possible values. So on average, we'd need four attempts. That is, assuming someone randomly chooses a key. So normally when we measure uh, brute force attack, we consider what is the total number of possible keys and we may talk about what is the maximum number of attempts. In this case, it would be eight. And what is the average number of attempts? In this case, it would be the key space divided by two, which is four attempts. And what this table shows is the average number of attempts. If we have two to the power of 32 keys, on average, we take two to the power of 32 divided by two attempts, which is 2 to the power of 31. And what this table gives us is some example times it takes. Let's say we have a computer and it, to do one decryption it takes one microsecond, which means one million decryptions per second. Okay. If that was the case, if I had a 32-bit key 2 to the power of 32 or 4 billion possible keys, my computer would take about 35, 36 minutes to find the key. Okay? If I had many computers and I could go much faster and much faster computers such that I could in decrypt 1 million ciphertexts per microsecond, that's 1 million times faster than this column, then it would take 2 milliseconds to decrypt. So almost no time. How fast is a computer? How fast can it decrypt? Then in nowadays that these times are quite easy for most computers or a network of computers or dedicated computers. These times of a million decryptions per microsecond uh, pushing the limits of some systems. Uh, when we look at DES, I'll give you some more examples of how long it takes to break a real cipher. So, how do we make it... L so, a brute force attack, in theory, is always successful, but in practice, it takes a long time and is only successful if we can complete the attack in a reasonable amount of time. If we have a 128-bit key, our ultra-fast computer would take 10 to the power of 18 years. Who's going to wait for the end of the world to <laughs> find the plain text or the key? Okay? So just by increasing the key length, we can avert a brute force attack. Because with 128 bits, even with the fastest of the fast computers, it's still going to take thousands of years to find the key. So brute force in theory is successful, but in practice it can be averted, we can avoid it by having a key that is large enough. Caesar cipher key length, there are just 26 keys. Not very good. Most real ciphers today use 128 bits or larger block ciphers, so the key length is not a problem. finish with one last example. Caesar cipher no good because the key length is just 26 or there's just 26 possible values. 
to break it, we can do a brute force attack. Expand on the Caesar cipher, but allow any letter in our 26 uh, letter alphabet to map to any of the one other letters. So what you do to choose a key is you have your alphabet of letters A to Z and a key in this case is a mapping. So we have A, B, C. I choose a mapping from each letter to some other letter. Let's say I choose A to map to Q. A can map to one of 26 other letters. B can map to how many other letters? Well, B can map to any of the other letters except Q. Let's say I choose S. There were 25 possible values to choose from. Then I choose C maps to some other letter. I can choose from 24 letters. There's 24 letters remaining. Whatever I choose, A. And I keep going like that. What I do is I choose a mapping from each of the letter in the alphabet to some other letter. Z would map to the last letter available, whatever it was. The number of choices I have of mappings is from A to one of 26 possible letters, B to one of 25 possible letters, C to one of 24 possible letters, and Z to one of the only one last possible letter. The number of possible mappings is 26 factorial. And each mapping in this case defines a key. In this cipher, where we allow any letter to map to any other letter, we have 26 factorial possible keys. And go back to our, that's this one, 26 characters, permutation, take our computer six million years to break this cipher. So we've gone from a Caesar cipher which has 26 keys to a, even a simple cipher, but now has 4 by 10 to the power of 26 keys. And a brute force attack, attack would be not practical in this case. So it's very easy to increase the number of keys in this case. Once you have a mapping, then to encrypt, you just take, if I, I want to encrypt the, uh, the word hello, then I find H, find the corresponding ciphertext letter. And that's the output. E, L, L, O, and encrypt. That's what's called a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. We still substitute one letter with another letter. Monoalphabetic meaning we use a single alphabet for both the plaintext and ciphertext. And brute force is impossible in this case because it takes too long if you wanted to try it. We will stop there and we'll go back about keys uh, next week and go through some other classical ciphers.